Hey everybody, well we got a great one for a change and this time I really mean it. Frank Four is with us today. Frank is a staff writer for the Atlantic Monthly and one of the great journalists and thinkers of our time in, in my humble opinion. I believe this is Frank's fifth time on the podcast. Uh, record keeping is not our, our strong suit on the Al Franken podcast. Uh, Frank's been on about Russia before and has written uh, extensively about Ukraine, including a uh, definitive Atlantic cover story profile of Paul Manafort uh, that went into uh, great detail about all the ill-gotten uh, money Manafort made propping up uh, President Viktor Yanukovych, Putin's corrupt stooge uh, in Ukraine. So I know this is uncharacteristic of my intros, but this one is a great one. What can I say? Frank uh, wrote a piece very recently in The Atlantic about just how well President Biden and his team handled uh, the lead up to this crisis, including doing some almost unprecedented moves, making some unprecedented moves like the early release of our intelligence uh, conclusions that, that Putin was going to invade. And that gave us time to work with our allies to create a sanctions regime far enough in advance that we could trigger them almost from day one. Now, part of that team is Tony Blinken. Uh, Tony is a, is a friend. He plays in a band that a number of my uh, friends play in. And Tony's a really good guitarist, especially for a Secretary of State. And when Joe Biden announced uh, he was nominating Tony for that job, I texted Tony. I said, I uh, wrote, congratulations. I hope nothing bad happens uh, during the next four years. The situation in Ukraine is uh, bad and is becoming more and more tragic every day. Uh, Putin has said uh, that he's put his nuclear arsenal on high alert, which is kind of checkmate in terms of the U.S. and and NATO establishing and enforcing a no-fly zone. Now, I don't know if you remember Nixon's madman theory. Uh, according to Kissinger, this is after Nixon left us, uh, Nixon told me to tell Ho Chi Minh that I can't control him and that Nixon... Uh, could use nuclear weapons. Now, Nixon was bluffing, but this was believable. Putin has been doing a, a very good job selling the madman theory, the 30-foot table, uh, for example. Uh, Trump didn't have to sell the madman theory. In their book, Peril, Washington Post reporters Bob Woodward and Robert Costa wrote that after the 2000 election, General Mark Milley, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, was concerned that Trump might start World War III by ordering a nuclear strike. And I, I will say this, before the election, I tweeted, and you can check out my tweets, I tweeted this, now is not the time to take the nuclear code away from Trump. Now is the time to give him the wrong code. Now imagine Obama trying to convince Putin that he's a madman. Uh, let me uh, uh, be clear. Um, I'm uh, uh, totally crazy. The Ukrainian people have uh, shown unbelievable courage and, of course, have drawn inspiration from President Zelensky. President Zelensky, as you know, is a comedian, and there's no one more courageous than comedians, especially Jewish comedians, especially Jewish comedians who went into politics. Now, I bring up Tucker Carlson during my conversation with Frank, mentioning uh, something that's really bothered me, and it's that Carlson, on the day Putin invaded Ukraine, Tucker, on his show, wondered aloud why Democrats have been telling Americans that they should hate Vladimir Putin. What is, what is this really about? Tucker wondered. Why am I supposed to hate Putin so much? Has Putin ever called me a racist? Has he shipped every middle-class job in my town to 
to Russia? Is he trying to snuff out Christianity? Carlson has a point, I guess. Putin hadn't done any of those things. So why did I hate Tucker so much? I mean, has Tucker poisoned me with nerve agents just because I disagree with him? Has Tucker bombed the maternity ward in my in my hometown? Has Tucker killed my children? No. Tucker hasn't done any of that. And yet I hate him so much. And I can't stop. Maybe there's something wrong with me. Well, Frank is coming straight away, and it is most definitely a great one. You know, for a change. You wrote a piece for what's it called? The Atlantic Monthly. Um, you know what? It's uh, the Atlantic all the time yeah, because of digital, so you can get it anytime you want. That's right. You don't get it on the newsstand anymore. Anyway, you wrote this piece about uh, Biden answering uh, the three a.m. call. Yes. Now, uh, that's referring to uh, the nasty ad that Hillary (laughs) put up about uh, you couldn't trust Obama, maybe. She didn't use his name, right? It was, uh, but it was during the 16 campaign, during the primary campaign, she was suggesting that you need someone experienced like her to answer the 3 a.m. call, which would be the, there's a crisis. Right. It was an iconic ad. It was iconic ad. It was like the Daisy ad, but less iconic, but almost <laughs> as iconic. Okay, so basically, so he gets the uh, 3 a.m. call, which is Putin has invaded <laughs> invaded Ukraine. And um, I had to agree with the article. He's, he's handled it really well. Is that That's basically what you're saying. He handled it like someone who had confidence in himself and from his experience. Is that right? Right. Well, and I think what was important is that, um, I mean, the metaphor of the 3 a.m. call breaks down slightly because I think what he did, I mean, the 3 a.m. phone call really was months ago when they started to see the troop movements in in Russia and then Belarus, where it was pretty clear that an invasion was happening and they had other streams of intelligence that were coming into the administration that that showed that something was likely imminent. And at that stage, they did a couple of important things. One is that they started to develop a sanctions package that was actually quite creative because it was so comprehensive. And um, sanctions are a little bit hard to flip on like a switch. Um, In order for them to be effective, they have to be kind of globally enforced or close to globally enforced. And uh, they did things that were designed to really hurt Russia where it counts. So uh, shutting down uh, various technology transfers that they were accustomed to receiving, um, in addition to trying to just really squeeze the Russian financial system. The point is, they didn't go like, oh my God, David, they are attacking. Let's put up sanctions plan together. They they started as soon as they saw the yeah. troops assembling. Yeah. And Biden, one of the um, uh, his kind of uh, mottos as a as a foreign policy president is that he likes to telegraph what he's doing to his adversary. So his adversary is never surprised by by his actions. So it's clear if you do this, Putin, you'll be on the receiving end of the sanctions package. And he likes to make it clear what he's not going to do as well so that there's no risk of miscalculation. I think he's been criticized for that. People will say, well, you know, couldn't you have blustered a little bit more and threatened Putin with military action? And Biden's attitude is consistently, I don't want to make him think I'm about to do something which I'm not going to do. My credibility over the long run, even with somebody who I detest rests on his trusting me to be a good faith actor. So when it comes time to negotiate a way out of this, he doesn't mistrust Biden. Also, he isn't, uh, people don't get jumpy. (laughs) So yeah, (laughs) it's it's generally a good rule of thumb that you don't want the uh, holder of the world's largest nuclear arsenal to be jumpy. Okay, let me write that down. Otherwise, I'll forget it. Sure, shoot. 
just in case I'm in that position. So, <laughs> and there are a number of, of points that you made here in terms of the way he did this that showed both sort of experience and, and a certain approach to foreign policy, including being calm. And, but, and also sort of announcing what our intelligence was on them, which I, that was unusual. I don't think I had seen it's that. It's an interesting tactic because, first of all, you know, I, I, the head of the CIA is William Burns, who had been ambassador to Russia and who is uh, one of the most experienced American diplomats. And so you have this interesting confluence between diplomacy and intelligence where at the risk of exposing our sources and we have broadcast to the world, you know, this is happening. We have good reason to believe this. And it was a risk because what if, what if it turned out that we were being played? What if it turned out that Russia wasn't going to actually invade? We would look like fools and we would, the world wouldn't trust us. Or um, what if that ended up resulting in the assassination of the people who were our sources on the inside? That would have been, that would have been tragic as well. And obviously, we, that, that intelligence wasn't fully trusted. The Ukrainians, for one, doubted what we were saying in the run-up to the war. But I think in retrospect, it was really important because it bought space for the diplomatic program. So he, he announces that the invasion is imminent and that that's the thing that allows him to start to begin to pressure the Europeans to talk about sanctions, to think about sanctions. I see. And um, I think it, it plays a really important role. What, what is an, a really incredible global response? I mean, I, and I think it's also interesting to contrast this to the Russian invasion of Georgia in 2008 or the Russian invasion of Crimea in 2014 in, in, in Donetsk and Luhansk, or even the Russian interference in the 2016 presidential election. I mean, there really wasn't much of a price that Russia paid for any of those events, let alone the times that it's assassinated its political opponents. Is this a learning curve or is this a difference in personality between Obama and Biden? Well, I think that they're, they're different moments um, for okay. the start, okay. for starters. So, so Russia, uh, Ukraine is in a very different place now than it was in 2014. When, when Russia invaded Crimea and Eastern Ukraine in 2014, Ukraine had just had this revolution. It didn't actually have uh, a president. It was it was a very a very weak position. It didn't have an army that was up to the task of battling the Russians, and so they got rolled in that invasion. So that's a pretty important difference. But I do also think that there's a lot of learning that's happened since then. I'm sure at the forefront of the Biden administration's mind is also what Putin did to the United States in 2016. And that he got away with it. And that makes him an even different adversary than he was in 2014. There's also, I think that Biden learned from Obama and the difficulty that Obama had when he set his red line in Syria mm -hmm. and then ended up backing away from it. I think that that looms really large in Biden's own thinking that he feels like if he's going to lay down a marker, it has to be a marker that he's willing to follow through on it, that he has to, he has to mean it when he says something like that. I never quite understood why Obama just didn't immediately respond to that. It was, uh, the red line was, uh, Syria uses poison gas against the civilians, uh, will respond. And they did. And we didn't. Yeah. And I remember I was at the state fair in Minnesota. We have our state fair leads up to labor day. I did the big interview. There's like 300, Minnesotans sitting on lawn chairs on, on this grass hill, and, and uh, the host asked me, well, what should Obama do? They, they use poison gas against their, their people. What should we do? And I said, he drew a red line. He should bomb them. And the people, Minnesotans there didn't like that. We were in Iraq. We were in Afghanistan. There was no appetite to go to another Mideastern country to war. And um, I paid a little bit of a price for that. Uh, it was not a popular, um, my stance wasn't popular, but that's, that's, that's the way it goes. Well, there's a really, I find the question of, you know, what will trigger Putin? What, what, what is, what is Putin's red line to be a really fascinating question, which boy, oh boy. nobody has an answer to, but he's, he's, he's thrown around um, the nuclear word. That's a uh, big word. Yes. <laughs> it's a big word. 
Now, here's my theory. It's it's the madman theory, right? Yeah. It, it's basically uh, Kissinger said that, uh, he, you know, that uh, Nixon told me to, to help the Ho Chi Minh, that I can't control Nixon and that he might use nuclear weapons. And you kind of believed it with Nixon, right? You kind of believed madman. And yeah. uh, with Trump, of course you'd believe man. And with Putin, the 30-foot table, that sort of <laughs> – you buy that, right? Yeah. yeah. Can you imagine Obama, though, trying to sell the madman theory? <laughs> um, let me uh, be clear about uh, this. I'm, I'm totally crazy. <laughs> you wouldn't buy that from I'm gonna eat I'm gonna slowly eat two almonds this hour. <laughs> oh, <laughs> wild and crazy. So we we are dealing with this though. Uh and then our I I think in the intelligence hearing in the House the other day, they basically said they aren't seeing any mobilization of their nukes at all. I don't know how much solace that gives you, but you see like the, the poles uh, don't want to send uh, those MIGs right uh, into directly in the Ukraine. They instead want to send them to Ramstein air force base, our base in Germany. And uh, we don't want to do that. Yeah. Can, what's your, what's your view of that? Yeah, it was like, there was a very odd episode just because it was handled just in such a sloppy way almost the opposite of what you had written about how yeah. well biden had, had done this but this is this might not have been Biden. it might be, it might be on the poll I, I i put it on the yeah. polls because i think that they you know they had a cabinet meeting they put out a press release that this was happening they put out the press release before they got the full go-ahead from us um and for us to have accepted the planes and then sent them to ukraine i think we needed to get germany's position because the base is in german territory and everything hadn't been lined up in advance and i you know what i gather about the polish government is that there's been a, a degree of turmoil there a change of governments that 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 a lot of the diplomatic corps has disappeared it's just it was not an artful moment in this whole saga but they need the MIGs. I, you know, my 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 suspicion is that this will get worked out, but it's going to require more creativity than was brought to bear um, earlier this week. Right. We're going to have to be more creative <laughs> than we even have been. But uh, so Putin, basically everyone is saying complete miscalculation on his part, Right. No idea that the that the Ukrainians would respond this way. It, it, is that correct? I mean, are are you along with everybody I think else? That is, I think that's correct. I think it's also he didn't really expect the world to respond in the way that the world has responded. I think that that, in a way, is the bigger deal for him. I think it would be easier for him to tolerate a long, drawn-out conflict in Ukraine than to have the Russian economy cut off from the rest of the world. That's the thing that ultimately threatens his hold on power. But I think it's interesting to just reflect for a moment on the question of why he's doing this now, which you know, requires us to peek into his mind, which means that it's going to be a speculative exercise. But clearly, he's got this, this long-held desire to reclaim Ukraine, which he views as part of it's as Russia's birthright. It's part of the Russian Empire. It was a grand historic humiliation to be deprived of that. But I, you know, up until very recently, he was able to influence Ukrainian politics by messing with its democracy. That there were oligarchs who were sympathetic to Putin, who were doing business with Russia, and then took kind of the, the kickbacks from Putin in order to basically fund pro-Russian political parties in the country. And when Zelensky was elected in 2019, he is a Russian speaker who ran on this platform of trying to unify the country. Now, if you will recall, Paul Manafort, Donald Trump's campaign chairman, had worked in Ukraine for a very long period of time. And one of his devices for helping his preferred 
pro-Russian candidate was to try to polarize the nation along linguistic lines. And um, a lot of people who worked with Manafort said that he was essentially applying the Republican Southern strategy to try to cleave the country by geography. And so he tried to to pit Russian speakers against Ukrainian speakers. Russian speakers were yeah. Smart. We're being victimized. And so when Zelensky gets elected as a Russian speaker who's appealing to the Ukrainian speaking part of the country in a spirit of unity, and you have, I think, also this revolution in 2014, which is a shock to the system. And the fact that the country was invaded by Russians stirred up a sense of Ukrainian patriotism that hadn't really existed in such a universal way before. And so Zelensky comes in and he does have the effect of bringing the country together politically, however briefly, in a way that it hadn't been brought together before. And I think that that is something that Putin looked at and worried about, that he no longer had a good means of influencing Ukraine through illiberal democracy. And then uh, Zelensky's record on challenging corruption was a little bit mixed, but he ended up arresting a Ukrainian oligarch called Medvedchuk, who was very close to Putin, and they were they were actual chums. And when he got arrested, I think Putin interpreted that as like yet another sign that his ability to influence events within Ukraine was being seriously constrained. And so you look at all of that, I'm sure Putin must have looked at the Afghanistan withdrawal and the way that that was botched and interpreted that as a sign of American weakness. Um, And I think that he had this long-term plan to divide the West. And if you were Putin and you're looking at American politics and you're looking at how polarized we've become, you look at Europe and how polarized it's become, he was probably sitting, you know, leaning back in his chair, cackling, you know, ha ha, I've, I've, I've done it. I've actually, you know, the week, the West is now as decadent and as divided as I said it was. And so this is the moment to strike. As opposed to me being decadent and my oligarchs being decadent. <laughs> <laughs> Make America decadent again. <laughs> So now he's going, oh, well, I made a miscalculation, right? He's saying that. Is he saying that? I mean, it's... it's. Um... I don't know. Well, you know him <laughs> better. Yeah, that's why you're on. I, 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 it's sort of a statement in the form of a question. The terrifying thing about Putin is that the fact of him sitting at the end of that long table is kind of actually not just, it's a, it's a metaphor. It's like he is, he has this inner circle that has collapsed onto himself. And so apparently he's kind of rushing down to the, the bunker in, in the basement of uh, the Kremlin to uh, review what's happening on the battlefield every day. But it's not clear that he's got a, a very wide circle that's feeding him a very, realistic sense or or he has people who are who are pushing back against him in any way shape or form so you know i think that when you're an embattled uh wartime leader it's it's also pretty easy to convince yourself that things aren't as bad as they actually are so maybe he doesn't realize that he's miscalculated i mean think about how long it took the united states to realize that it had miscalculated in iraq it, it was it wasn't oh, something yeah. It wasn't something that happened overnight. Well, this is all very overnight. I mean, this is how old is this now? When was the invasion? I think it's we're close to two weeks now. And he's doubling down, evidently, right? I mean, that's he's sending more troops in. He's he's kind of got everybody in that that they had assembled. Is that correct? Yeah. Well, I think that the scary part of his doubling down is that the doubling down is the is in the choice of targets that he chooses to go after. That it's, um, you know, the, 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 real, the real fear for the Ukrainians is that they are reliving a disaster that befell Chechnya, that befell Syria. And the disgusting part of Russia war plans is that it involves smashing hospitals. It involves destroying apartment blocks, that there's no, there's no distinction between uh, military targets and civilian targets. It's all fair game. He did that in Syria. This guy is a KGB guy. Yeah. And did we miscalculate him? Or was there a too long a period where we didn't know who this guy was? Um, 
you know, there was a period clearly where we didn't know who this, where we we miscalculated him. I mean, like was, Trump, for example, seemed to like him. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, um, and you know, Trump with all his uh, foreign policy background, and uh, I know how he conferred with experts all the time. <laughs> but my my God, uh, what would have happened if 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 Trump had won? It's not a useful exercise, is it? No, it's it it, it it's <laughs> not. I mean, I, I um, you know, it he, conditions for Putin were so great when Trump was in office. I mean, NATO, NATO was such a divided alliance for those four years, and Trump, every time he got on the phone with Zelensky, was maybe intentionally or unintentionally undermining Ukrainian democracy by asking Zelensky to corrupt himself and to corrupt the prosecution of uh, justice. Um, and so I think that what what Trump did was, you know, beg Ukraine to essentially erase <laughs> its democratic gains and to revert back to a Russian style system where oligarchs prevailed and that you could you could you could go after your enemy in this mafia sort of way. Where do you think the Republican Party has come in the last two weeks? Did they start sort of Trumpian and, and uh, move to standing up in, in the State of the Union? And did they reverse themselves very quickly? Or is that is, are they divided? I mean, they are divided. It's just not clear how many are left in the pro-Putin camp other than Tucker Carlson at this stage. But it's, it's interesting. I was at... Um, I went to CPAC, the Conservative Political Action Convention, which was down in Orlando right. two weeks ago, and Trump spoke there. But I, I kind of watched this happen before my very eyes, where you could see that at first they had the deer in he headlights saying they didn't quite know how to respond. It was clear that Ukraine had been morally wronged. But if they st stood up and said that Putin was an evil guy, there was this fear that somehow they were crossing align with Trump. And so they were just, they, they moved around it very, very gingerly. One of the most interesting speeches I saw there was by Nigel Farage, who was the, the, the architect of Brexit, who was kind of Trump's English sidekick. Yeah. He came in and, and he, he played this role of trying to explain to the convention why it was he'd gotten Putin wrong himself. He's, and he was like, I thought Putin was a rational guy. I thought he was only going to invade just a little bit of Ukraine. Like, you know, we would have given him Eastern Ukraine. We would have given him these other parts. But then he invaded the whole thing. And, you know, boy, we never saw that coming. I was wrong. He's, <laughs> he's a monster. We all have to stand up to him like he's a monster now. That's the Tucker thing. He goes, you know, what has Putin done? Why is he so yeah. bad? You know, he hasn't done anything racist. He hasn't called me a racist. <laughs> right. And I'm thinking of like, uh, why do I, you know, why should I hate Tucker Carlson? He hasn't poisoned me with nerve agents. Uh, he hasn't sentenced me to 15 years hard labor <laughs> in Siberia for disagreeing with him. He hasn't firebombed my city. He hasn't killed my children. Why should I fucking hate Tucker? Yeah. Why indeed? Um, <laughs> what Sorry. was interesting? Did that sound bitter? <laughs> it was interesting to hear the distance between how conservatives would react when they heard the name Justin Trudeau, which would would cause them all to just emit the loudest, nastiest, most prolonged boos, and then when they'd hear the name Vladimir Putin, and you know th they would. They would applaud some statement of strength or, you know, applaud anybody if they accuse Joe Biden of weakness. But it was really totally evident that Justin Trudeau is like the real source of evil in the world. And he's the one we should be focused on. Right. He's our adversary. Did that just suddenly emerge because of the, the trucker strike? Yeah. Yeah. So suddenly Justin Trudeau became that. Yeah. Boy. I mean, it's like when I was at, do you remember um, the famous uh, New Republic boring headline contest where it was a, it was a, <laughs> no. quest to, a quest to find the most boring headline in the world. And uh, they, they, they discovered it, which was there was a headline in uh, the Washington Post that, that read, Worthwhile Canadian Initiative. 
And so <laughs> it was like Canada went from being the, the country that it was like impossible for Americans to elicit any strong feelings about <laughs> to, to becoming <laughs> worse than Vladimir Putin's Russia. <laughs> well, among, <laughs> among yeah. conservatives. And, and so they're, they're going, they're just confused now, the conser- very conservatives about this. They're going through Cirrus, as we well, say. The, the one way in which they're uh, not confused is it's just all Biden's fault. So right, doesn't matter what he's done. <laughs> doesn't matter what Trump did, but it's all Biden's fault. I do think that the line that uh, you know when you when you invoked uh, Kissinger earlier as kind of adopting the madman theory of of foreign policy, where you've got to unnerve your adversary by acting a little bit crazy, that's their defense of Trump. Is like Trump. Trump was so he was so bad shit. Putin would have never invaded Ukraine because you've no idea how he's going to respond. I mean that that's literally for them. No, wait a minute. We had every idea how Trump would respond. <laughs> <laughs> we knew exactly he'd do nothing. Yeah. Yeah. That's funny cuz it's the exact opposite. It's the exact opposite. <laughs> <laughs> so, they're just all over the place. They don't have any actual thing they uh, believe in. Well, no, they believe in they believe in fossil fuels. So if there's ever an excuse <laughs> to drill, baby, drill, let's take advantage of it. <laughs> well, that is that is now, boy. Yeah, it was so interesting. I saw a Republican on Fox. I saw I've been watching a little bit of Fox, and uh, I saw a Republican congresswoman. She was criticizing climate activists, and I went like, "Hey, that's accurate." yes we've been saying that maybe we shouldn't have the keystone pipeline because we're climate activists and i went like oh my god someone was criticizing us climate activists but like calling us exactly what we were (laughs) and not even being that awful about it i mean not going like this has put us in a terrible position as a country. And then it was Tucker later going like, Democrats are all, you know, the, the establishment, they're all wealthy and they don't care about gas going up like Tucker does. Because <laughs> Tucker doesn't want it to be $8 a gallon because I don't think Tucker can afford it. Listen, that. listen, the, the private jet that takes him to uh, Palm Beach and up to Maine, it, you know, it doesn't come for free. Have a little bit of sympathy. I, I just we're all we're all suffering in this moment. Okay, well, uh, let's let's leave him. So, is Putin alive a year from now? I don't want to get you in trouble. I don't want Putin going like that, Frank Four. I'm gonna I'm gonna get him. Yeah, but I, I'll I'll, uh, I'll mind my tea. How, how does this play out in Russia? Because Russians are they can't not get this forever. The emails I've exchanged with Russian intellectuals who in the past have been willing to criticize Putin and who've been um, active participants in American political conversations, they're just terrified right now. They don't want to go to Siberia for 10 years. Yeah, they're filled with with sadness about um, how they've been silenced. um, And they're filled with terror because they are indeed keeping silent. And so- it's not clear. I mean, it's going to, it's to me, it, it, you know, our strategy right now is basically to instigate a coup. I mean, that's, that's what the sanction strategy is ultimately, whether we say it or not, it's regime change. It's pretty clear at this stage that we've imposed the most incredible sanctions ever on, on Putin and it hasn't changed his behavior in the least. And it doesn't feel like it's going to change his behavior in the short term. And the only way his behavior will change is if there is suddenly this wave of pressure, either from the elites, I mean, it would presumably come from the elites, or from the the people themselves, or elites who felt pressured by the people. Right now, it's uh, we need this economic pressure to culminate in political pressure on Putin that presumably could ultimately have the effect of knocking the guy out of power. But it's, you know, there's nothing that we're seeing right now that suggests that that's imminent. But I got to imagine that if you think about 
this reverse iron curtain. So you have the where it's not, I guess it is an iron curtain where you have generations of Russians who've lived their whole lives kind of enjoying technology, enjoying uh, Starbucks, enjoying like the, the, the fruits of globalization. And then overnight it's been stripped away from them. That's got to sting as just a psychological matter that the world hates you so much that it's decided to take away all these good things in life. And uh, to like, just know that that Ikea store, <laughs> the flat packed furniture isn't coming back anytime soon. There aren't affluent suburbs of Moscow where they're going like, let's keep Starbucks and Ikea out. <laughs> <laughs> they haven't quite evolved to that, yeah, have they? No. <laughs> yes. That's not, we don't want the. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, it's also, okay. it's like, I, it's, it's, the, the oligarchs, you know, we've, we're hitting these oligarchs and morally that seems to me completely the correct thing to do. Um, let's take away their yachts. Um, uh, you know, parentheses, we haven't really hit them as hard as we could. I mean, the UK and even the United States has only gone after a relatively limited number of rich Russians at this stage. I also think that taking away your billion dollar yacht is bad. But if you have a billion dollar yacht, <laughs> you probably have a nice house. Yes. And a nice car. Yes. And a nice vacation house. Yes. That, that isn't the same as being a refugee, uh, taking your little kids to Poland. I mean, so who are these people in position to take Putin out? I think it's ultimately, I think the military, if I were to just, I'm just speculating here, mm -hmm. but it feels to me like the military would have to be the one that would have to make a move against him at first. How do you write that scene? Is it like, uh, is it Putin going like, damn, damn, we must send, you know, he's must send more troops to kill more civilians. And is it finally some guy going like, uh, Igor and I would like to talk to you. <laughs> I mean, how does, it, how does that scene go down? Right. I like that. I think you nailed it. <laughs> <laughs> and what, what do you mean talk <laughs> like that that's the scene <laughs> yeah there's definitely definitely strangulation involved um there, there isn't a scene where they go like vlad we're sending you to monaco <laughs> You're going to have a nice estate there and maybe that maybe probably think, wouldn't be the place takes, but when you get sent to your dacha it's yeah. also a prelude to the inevitable, right? Like that. But at a certain point, the military, you know, we now know that their commanders were getting killed in the battlefield, and so uh, presumably back in Moscow, their 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 military leaders who were having friends of theirs actually die, and they know that they're dying because this whole operation has been badly bungled from the start and that Putin kept information on way too tight a hold and that you have, you have a demoralized army. You have an army that is like in certain places having to loot stores in order to feed itself. Um, it's, 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 it's an embarrassment really for, for the army. So how does this play out in Ukraine? So they're leveling all these cities so fighters go into the forests. They go. What? 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 How does this work? How does? Uh, how does this become a guerrilla war? And when? Well, am I asking you stuff that you that this way? Yeah, this may either, be. This is like maybe a little bit. I, I'm I'm happy to like to talk, but it's like this isn't, my, <laughs> this isn't exactly my area of expertise. But yes, I mean I'm just just talking. Um, okay, uh, good. That's <laughs> what we do here. It's a podcast. <laughs> yeah. Um, do you fact check your podcast? <laughs> I, to um, the extent I can, but I can't fact check your speculation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that is the beauty of speculation. It can only be, <laughs> only be fact checked after the fact. And then it's yeah. just, it was speculation. Um, yeah. I mean, aren't we, are, it's just like, there's going to be a decisive battle for the capital, right? That that's, 
that's where this is all ultimately headed. And then does that become a guerrilla war? Yeah, it becomes a street. It's a street by street grill war. I think one of the things that's interesting to learn as this war goes on is the ways in which the United States anticipated that. And so we've been sending the arms that we've been sending, we were sending Ukraine in the weeks leading up to the invasion were the weaponry that they would need for close Uh urban warfare. And you just know that that's, that's something that could go on for a very long time. And it's going to be, it's going to be horrible to watch. There, I said something really, really, really unobvious. It's going to be horrible to watch, but for some people, (laughs) (laughs) there are people who like to watch those things. I, I was thinking of like, there are American veterans who are volunteering to go and are going, I guess, right? Yeah, it can't help but put one in the mind of the Spanish Civil War, where you had a conflict that also seemed like um, a hinge moment in a battle between democracy and authoritarianism, where you had a bunch of foreign fighters go there. I think a lot of the foreign fighters who were attracted to a battle like this or I mean, they're, they're just people who um, are, are junkies for, for war. A lot of them are just thrill seekers. So I don't, I don't mean to romanticize them at all. I read an article about this where they were discouraging people who wanted to go there who would actually just get in the way. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's, a, there's, a foreign, there's a foreign legion that's forming with the support of the Ukrainian state. Okay. But like, if I have not had any combat experience, yeah, <laughs> and I'm 70 years old, and all it would be like, I'd be just going like, "How do you do this? <laughs> Could you just go back to the states?" <laughs> no, I want to help, and I don't. So, uh, so if you really can't be of, of assistance, and you're watching this, don't go. Is what I'm saying. <laughs> you know. So, uh, well, uh, Zelensky is inspiring the world, and and you sent me uh, him playing uh, the piano with his uh, comedy partner at the time, or at least they did this bit, which is on YouTube, and you just think of, like, man, that's a span of a career. Yeah. Because in it, he is playing uh, Hava Nagila uh, with his penis. I, I believe schlong is the uh, uh, yeah, conceptually yeah. the schlong. <laughs> yeah. It would be the Yiddish. And uh, you just go like, okay, that looks presidential to me. <laughs> well, it, it's a, uh, you know, a comedy just has a big span of what it includes. And uh, that, wasn't included in what we <laughs> did during that period. Um, but uh, it, it was an amazing uh, piece of, of footage. I think there's like, there's maybe an interesting riff for us to do about comedy and politics and, and comedy's place in society, because it's tr- So I, I can describe to you kind of what Zelensky experienced. I think maybe it took, maybe it tracks a little bit the American experience with, uh, with, with comedy coming out of, the 1960s, which is that uh, Zelensky grew up as the Soviet Union is collapsing. And uh, one of the things that that moment opened up was the opportunity to make fun of people in power. And so he became part of uh, an improvisational comedy troupe that would compete in these competitions that were on television. And a lot of what they did was impersonation of famous people. And so you were taking, they they were in effect taking things that were said in the privacy of the kitchen table, and then they were turning them into jokes that were broadcast on national television. And so it was an experience of freedom, really, uh, uh, and of political expression. And comedy had this explosion after the, the fall of the Soviet Union. And I think that the reason it, it, it did was because it, it did represent this possibility that had been foreclosed before. And it kind of strikes me that like a lot of what comedy was in the United States after the 1960s, it was this kind of explosion of freedom that came with the breakdown of 
old conformism, old taboos. You had like a whole new, much wider range of uh, topics that you could openly discuss. Well, I remember the Smothers Brothers actually got canceled uh, because of their opposition to the war. But of course, SNL came on in 75, and that's as Nixon was leaving and Vietnam was ending. And uh, I remember thinking we were a counterculture. That was the word. It was you're a, we're a counterculture show. Mm. And and then I remember um, in '88 when Dan Quayle was uh, picked as uh, HW's Veep, and he was interviewed. And he, what was your favorite musician at Woodstock? And he said Jimi Hendrix. And I said, okay, maybe there's no counterculture anymore. (laughs) You know, maybe that's kind of over. And so, yeah, no, there was that definite moment where it was like, oh, my God, look what they're doing on TV. Yeah. And, And it also being extremely popular. And it was the only real comedy De- decent comedy variety show on at the time was Carol Burnett. Mm. And uh, Carol Burnett was a really good show. Those yeah. are really funny comedians, but not, you know, Tim Conway was not Lenny Bruce. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he, was, he was just great. He was just a yeah. great comedian. But then when we came, you know, Belushi would smoke, uh, smoke a joint on the TV. And you'd go like, uh, you know, as a character. So, yeah, I, I guess. So Zelensky does follow. That makes I would sense. Be, I'd love to uh, just hear you talk about, I mean, the, the fraternity of comedians turned politicians uh, can't be that large. Are there other are there, there, there are there other examples other than you and Zelensky of comedians who've run for office? I actually do think I'm, I can't think of anybody else. You think if somebody could think of somebody else, it'd be me. I, th- I would think, but I'm trying to think. So, I mean, have you, have you thought about that professional trajectory? I mean, obviously you've thought about it a lot in your own, your own life, uh, but watching Zelensky and, and watching his transformation in front of everybody's eyes as somebody who's maybe the only other person in the world who can identify with this, this full art. Well, of course it makes perfect sense to me. I mean, it does. <laughs> yeah. And, and it was, but it was because when I, I was doing political satire from starting in high school. Mm. Right. And a lot of people I know were doing political satire and I was doing it from pretty serious place i was trying to say something with my comedy i was trying to say something i felt was useful mm-hmm. right and <laughs> and uh and that's what the way i looked at it so I, it was a, a, a complete continuum to me i also did really silly comedy because i loved just pure comedy i did absurdist shit and you know but I was always very, very passionate about politics. That's why I went into politics. What do you, as an entertainer, um, I mean, I, the thing that's, I think, striking about Zelensky, and you look at both him playing the piano with the schlong and then him producing these incredibly powerful war videos, the thing that represents a continuity between the two is that he is in touch with his audience in a very, very deep sort of way. There's also another thing. He's a performer. And one of the things that when I was, let's say, in a judiciary hearing, I was very conscious when I was asking questions, and especially when I was asking questions to someone I did not care for them or what they were saying. I was very careful not to get too sarcastic or too cutting and i knew exactly i could feel it Mm. and he can feel it he's a performer and he knows what he's doing and i have colleagues that were brilliant but they aren't they didn't know how to create a viral moment because they weren't performers 
in the same way that a performer who performs has performed all his life as a performer. Now, on the one hand, that 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 sounds almost like an indictment. I mean, I think just the word performing uh, connotes inauthenticity. But I think that it isn't right, and especially. I mean, I think this is. This, I mean, I, I'm just going to point to the Zelensky example because it's couldn't be more striking the ways in which it isn't, which is that he may be performing. This may be the role of a lifetime. He may be nailing the role of a lifetime, but he's putting his life on the line. And so even if that he's using, if, if there's technique in those videos, they're still authentic in the most profound sort of way, which is that he's willing to die for what he's just said. No, there's no, uh, there's no go. Oh yeah, he's just performing. He's just like a, he was a comedian. Now he's <laughs> uh, uh, uh. no, he's risking his life and he's inspiring his people. And he's a big part of, I think, of what's going to bring Putin down because of that, because of the leadership, his leadership. Okay, well that's a, a great note to end on, which is me. <laughs> <laughs> And thank you, uh, Frank, for bringing you so much of you, which will be the first uh, 90% of the interview. (laughs) (laughs) Thanks, Al. Well, I I hope you enjoyed uh, listening. That beautiful music is by Leo Kotke, the great Leo Kotke. I want to thank Peter Ogburn for producing this podcast. We'll talk again next week.